welcome everyone to Eating Well on a Budget, uh, the latest in our series of Good Food for All webinars. And uh, it is, I'm very happy to be with you today. My name is Janelle Hatch, and I work as the coordinator um, of food literacy. And um, this webinar is brought to you by the Food Literacy Working Group of the Good Food Network. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background on the webinar itself for today. So just to let you know that um, everyone coming in is on mute for our webinar. And we have a panel of speakers joining us today, which is very exciting. Um, even though you are on mute, we still do want to hear from you. So you'll see that there's a, a Q&A feature. Um, so please do, if you have questions throughout our time today, um, put any questions that you have in the Q&A, and then hopefully we'll have time to address those in our last 10 or 15 minutes that we have allotted during the webinar for answering your questions. Um, and this webinar also is being recorded. And so for those who were not able to join us for the live uh, webinar today, it will be recorded and posted on the CR Fair website under food literacy so that people can um, catch up on it later. So um, I'm just going to move us forward here. So I think right now it's more important than ever to really be um, acknowledging um, where we live, the land that we live on. Um, and I always like to acknowledge that I'm a white settler to these lands. And we are so fortunate to be gathering here today on the lands of the Coast Salish peoples. And I am so grateful to live, work and play on the lands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples of the Songhees and Esquimalt nation. And every time I go outside and my hands are in the soil or I'm walking in the woods, I think it's really important to reflect on that and to think about our place here and those who were here before us. So I just wanted to start with that acknowledgement here today. So as I mentioned, um, the webinar today is um, brought to you by the Food Literacy Working Group. And um, we are a group of individuals and organizations that support and promote food literacy in the capital region. And um, just to start off, a lot of people wonder about the definition of food literacy. So just to let you know, our working definition of food literacy is that it includes food skills and practices that are learned and used across the lifespan to participate within a complex food environment. Food literacy also means appreciating the social, cultural, economic, physical, and environmental factors related to food. And a huge part of food literacy is also food skills too. And so that's a huge focus. Um, of, of our webinar today. Uh, so um, also I'd just like to cue you that um, our next webinar will be coming up in two weeks on Wednesday, June 17th. So hopefully you'll be able to join us then from 4 to 5 p.m. And the focus will be on the new South Island Farm Hub and on accessing local farm fresh food. In our region. So that will definitely be one that you might want to uh, tune in for. So without further ado, let's turn to our topic for today. So the purpose of our, um, of our webinar today really is about talking about eating well um, when you're on a budget, when it comes to food. And when I say eating well, my meaning really is that 
my belief is everyone has the right to nourishing, tasty food at all times. And even if you're on a budget, even if you're accessing food from emergency food sources, even if you're out collecting your food, it, I still believe that it's very important to focus on that nourishment um, and nourishing your mind and body as well. So there's so many aspects to our food and sharing our food together. And our panel of speakers today are all experts with many years of experience and keen interest in just that, in helping um, others to eat well and um, getting creative when it comes to um, what you have on hand and what you can do with it to make it into a really good meal. So um, I will start out by asking each of our panelists today um, to introduce themselves, um, introduce the, uh, the organization that they work with, and their experience with educating others on how to eat well when finances are limited. So maybe I'll just go in order of who I see on my screen here. So maybe I'll, uh, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen here so that we can see um, our speakers as they speak here. And I'll ask Kim maybe to start out today. Hi, everybody. My name is Kim Cummins, and I'm the program director at the Shelburne Community Kitchen Society, uh, lovingly referred to sometimes as the kitchen. Um, our organization is a neighborhood food center up in Saanich, uh, about almost 900 members tucked into a tiny bungalow, and we're all about getting folks together over great food and building community resilience and just having a lot of fun. Um, my experience in terms of, you know, educating others and working in community when it when we're talking about food literacy. Um, I've been with this organization um, since it started, was hired with the first grant uh, just over six years ago. Um, and so I've done a lot of teaching and working with uh, families and singles and all sorts of folks who are living on low income and looking to build and share their food skills with others. Um, before this, I was working for a few different nonprofits and then also doing my culinary arts degree. So lots of cooking experience. I just love cooking with other folks and eating good meals. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Kim. Thank you for joining us today. And then we'll move on to Allison. There you go. Uh, hi, <laughs> I'm Allison Power, and I currently have a contract with BC Housing, and I facilitate community kitchens um, with their tenants. I've also had um, contracts with uh, the Canadian Diabetes Association for about 11 years doing the food skills for families now it's being managed by uh, the CDC so but I haven't done anything yet there and uh, I've also done some independent workshops with a few of the First Nations um, on the reserves and um, yeah that's been great so um, what was the question what do I do <laughs> Uh, bring people together and uh, we break down recipes and make lots of food and enjoy eating together. Basically, that's, that's my job. <laughs> Thank you, Allison. And I just, I have to say that I was very fortunate to work with Allison for um, quite a number of years in Fernwood. And I learned a lot just from watching her in the kitchen. And she sparked my love for cilantro. So, <laughs> so yes, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much. And Sorry, on to Erlie now. Great. My name is Erlie Hermanson. Thanks so much for having me on today. I work with Island Health as one of the public health dietitians here. And I work in the Western communities as well as in Saanich, Victoria. Uh, let me see my um, experience in working with uh, food programs and cooking. 
with youth and adults. I think that's where I maybe know Allison from. I also uh, worked with the uh, Diabetes Association and their Food Skills for Families out here in Souk. Um, when that was running out here and I work with moms at Victoria Native Friendship Center and Her Way Home around low cost, um, low cost foods, healthy eating, um, quick and tasty meals and uh, foods that kids will eat. Um, yeah, so that's, I've had uh, quite a lot of fun in the kitchen. I, I love to cook. Um, I wish I could get my kids to cook a little more with me. They are more on the baker's side. They like cracking the eggs and then trying to lick the bowl, of course, like all children, which I don't let them do. I'm a terrible mother. And um, that's, uh, that's what I've been doing with food. Thank you, Early. And um, Early and I know each other very well. We've worked together for many years at yeah. Island Health. And uh, Early was my mentor when I first started out at yes. Island Health. Oh, and I wish I could make food look as good as Early does, because not only does she make tasty food, but the presentation. And that's so important too. And I have not mastered that, but I still try to learn from Early. Well, if we all have to have a superpower, Janelle, so yeah, that's my <laughs> okay. Making food look good, yeah. There you go. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Mm -hmm. nice. <laughs> okay, and on to last but definitely not least, Sonia. Hi everyone, I'm with the Food Share Network, and we support more than seventy organizations who are doing the work on the ground, supporting um, vulnerable people in our population who are food insecure and don't have access to sufficient uh, quantities of quality, nutritious, safe, uh, um, and culturally appropriate food. So we have um, some food support programs where we help uh, these organizations access food to distribute to their community, as well as just providing um, a place to connect and collaborate on issues coming up within these organizations. Um, my background with supporting um, food is I'm also a holistic nutritionist and I've worked with um, individual clients to help support them to eat nutritious diets um, while also tailoring it to specific health requirements or different conditions. Um, I've also worked with people who are on more limited budgets and supporting them to create nutritious diets on limited finances. Um, and my background, it also goes back to where, how I grew up. I grew up in a family that we were always really committed to eating a healthy diet, um, but my mom was also really um, uh, frugal in, in all her purchasing and this extended to food. So some of the techniques that my mom used, I continue to apply in my life. Um, you know, things like looking at sale items and buying in bulk and some other things that we'll be talking more about uh, today. Great, thank you so much, Sonia. And as you can tell from the, in, even from the introductions, it's gonna be a fun discussion today. I wish we could all be around a kitchen table having this conversation, but we'll just have to imagine that for today. Maybe next time we could all be around a kitchen table making some food at the same time as answering some questions. Um, so maybe just imagine that in your, your own mind. and. Uh, and we'll get started with a few other questions um, for our, our lovely guests here today. Um, so let's move on to our next question. So what are the top foods you would recommend to have on hand in your pantry that are both inexpensive and nutritious? So I know during this period of COVID, there's been a lot of talk about stocking up your pantry um, but maybe uh, I'd love to hear from each of our, our uh, speakers today on what they have in their pantry, what, what they find to be the best go-tos. So maybe if I could uh, I'll, um, uh, change up the order, not always make him go first. So um, maybe I'll uh, reverse it for now and, and see if Sonia would like to um, share. Sure. Um, so I extended pantry to a few items uh, that are also vegetables. 
But uh, some of my favorite items are that are inexpensive are oats, potatoes, onions, especially if you can buy a big bag in bulk and have somewhere to store it. Um, and then beans, chickpeas, and lentils. Um, and again, if you can buy these in as dry beans, it even makes it uh, a bit cheaper if you're willing to spend the time cooking them. But even buying them canned, you can usually get them um, at a pretty good deal. Um, tuna, also when it goes on sale, uh, it can be a good price. Um, in terms of looking at vegetables and fruit, um, I know it's not specifically a pantry item, but uh, buying them in season will kind of decrease the cost. And then for some other items, um, flax seeds are one of the most inexpensive seeds out there and also um, really nutritious with omega-3s. Um, and peanut butter, especially if you, when you can get it on sale, you can get the kind that is more natural, um, can also be a good item. So those are kind of the top items that um, I thought of um, for the pantry. Great, thank you. And. Um... Uh, maybe just something also to consider is um, how long some of the items last. Like Sonia was mentioning some dry uh, items, which would last quite a long time. And if you're able to stock up a little bit, keeping that in mind as well is what's, what's going to last a little bit longer and go a little bit further and you won't have to cycle through what's in there too often. So now maybe I'll uh, turn to Erli and see if she has anything to add to that or to agree with. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I agree with all of those. I think some of the other ones, that, the only ones, not much to add there, but certainly um, like canned tomatoes, if if Sonia didn't say canned tomatoes, that can be, that's one of my favorites. Um, also some of the, the grains, like I, oats for sure, like she mentioned, but also bulgur or, or cornmeal flour. I, um, I know it's tough to get flour these days at the grocery store, but to make corn, cornmeal scones for chili or things like that. Um, also like a whole grain pasta on, on hand canned fish i'm not sure if, i don't think she mentioned canned fish maybe you did maybe you didn't unless you have someone that you know that cans fish even better um, and then some of those other long shelf life uh, vegetables like carrots and beets lemons limes apples um, oranges those those although not typically thought of like pantry or dried goods um, they last a long time too Great, thank you. So Allison, what's your twist on this list? I feel like the, the new ones are, are getting slimmer and slimmer to pick from. Um, so yeah, I would definitely get behind the, the oats, uh, quinoa. I mean, I know it's not uh, cheap, but if you, you know, if you buy it on bulk and then share with a friend, like someone buys quinoa and someone else buys bulgur and then you split it, um, can cut the costs um, and not pantry item, but eggs. I find that if you buy them fresh from the farmer, they can last. And I don't think I've ever had them where they haven't last because I'll go through them so fast, but I literally will go to the farmer and buy four dozen eggs. And that's good for about a month, uh, five weeks. And um, yeah, they just become every meal basically, not every meal, but at least once a day, everybody's getting a good protein. Um, clearance items. I am like just all over clearance items. Um, also belonging to groups on Facebook of uh, people that will have stuff that they don't necessarily want the rest of anymore. My neighbors are always getting rid of stuff. So I'm always, I'll take your extra bag of oats because your kids don't like them. Um, so that helps my budget. <laughs> and uh, I have two boys. So we live off, he, one of them lives off peanut butter. So I buy usually you know, two or four of the large atoms, peanut butters, and um, ramen noodles. We make them, we keep the, you know, like the powdery stuff separate, but uh, we definitely use those often in stir fries and um, basically make, we make everything. I mean, spaghetti. <laughs> like, they're like 17 cents or something a package. So if you've, if you're really, you know, and he loves them. So 
and then my younger son says you can patch holes in the wall with them because he saw some YouTube video, which is fierce. Yeah, it's scary. But um, I think that's it. Uh, buying big blocks of cheese while they're cheap. And then I know it seems kind of expensive when you think I'm going to buy this block for 20 bucks, but then that block will last for a long time. I cut half and then I shred it and I put it in the freezer. So when I'm going to make something, I've already got shredded cheese and then I don't have to worry about it going green. Um, yeah, those are my pantry items. I think I got them. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> I, I love those. Now, see, I always get new ideas from all of you and yeah, uh, new, the noodles. Yeah, that's a really good one. And I really like that idea. I've only done that a couple of times and I don't know why I haven't done it more often with the cheese shredding it and then putting it in the freezer like that because if you put it in in the block hole when you take it out it crumbles and it's kind yeah. of a weird texture but if yeah. you're going to cook with it like i often have to make mac and cheese for my kids um and so having that pre-shredded too is great pull that shredded out goes on every meal goes on all the eggs <laughs> all the eggs that's right all so the eggs in every meal yeah, them going ramen noodles but yeah. Jesus <laughs> like. um uh kim um i'd love to hear your take now and just one thing that i haven't heard yet that i'd love to um, maybe pick your brain about is um herbs and spices because that's another pantry thing that um people often question on whether it's worth the buy yeah absolutely i mean it's nice to be part of this this group here because i mean so much of my own recommendations have already been hit and i think we're all on the same the same page but um so i mean already peanut butter one of my favorites because it's so versatile both for sweet and savory and then i mean of course diced tomatoes and all that good stuff that you guys mentioned so i won't go through lentils are kind of one of my favorites um, because it's really nourishing and easy to, to cook and you can use it in a lot of different ways. But when we're answering your question about spices, at least for me, I always recommend um, keeping it simple and buying, of course, like packages that are larger for the things that you use quite a lot of, but opting to purchase um, maybe from bulk stores, some of the ones that you don't use so often because um, over time, you know, they, they do kind of lose their potency and lose their flavor. Um, and uh, it's just good, I think, economically if there's a few different recipes that you can make your, your own spice combinations as well. So making your own Italian seasoning or making your own chili seasoning and things like that is, is great when you have a few different ingredients that you can also use independently. Um, and that just saves you from having to, you know, have an herb de Provence or something a little, a little wacky in the back of your cupboard, which maybe you won't use so often. So yeah, I mean, you guys really covered all of my favorites, you know, especially eggs and vegetarian proteins. Uh, lots of dried lentils and beans. I'm a big proponent of having kind of like the, the brown rice and, and lentils combo um, together. I always like having some black beans and, and canned corn in my pantry, um, you know, making some Texas caviar and some good stuff like that for something tasty and nourishing. But you guys hit all the bases, so I'm right on board with you. Okay, Kim, now I need to know what Texas caviar is. Oh, it's something I ate way too much of this weekend. I was having a craving, but it, it's essentially just um, uh, like black beans and, and corn niblets or, you know, like uh, any kind of peaches and cream and things. And then you are popping in uh, diced red onion and peppers if you have them, any other kind of veggies. I love um, sneaking in a little can of, of chilies if I have them, a little bit of lime juice um, and then cilantro if you have it. I hear now you like cilantro Janelle, so this is a recipe for you. Um, you can really like gassy it up as much as you want or keep it really simple, but with the lime juice and uh, just all those nice veggies, it's really filling and really inexpensive. Um, and it's a nice alternative to salsa. I use it in Buddha bowls. I'll use it as just a dip, all sorts of stuff. I'll just kind of eat it out of the bowl when no one's looking all by itself. Chips, chips be damned, you know? So it's pretty tasty stuff, but I'd look it up. That sounds great. Good idea. Great. Okay. So um, I, I just want to keep asking you guys so many more questions, but I'll stick to my, my script here, I promise. Um, so what are some of your favorite meals that do not cost a lot, but that are tasty and quick to prepare? 
because I know that's the other piece that people are always wanting is not having to spend too much time in the kitchen, um, especially if you have little people running around too. So um, maybe we'll uh, mix it up again and uh, ask Airely to maybe go first if she can. Okay, great. Yes, I, thanks. Okay, well, I'd have to say my favorites would be soups, like lentil soup. I know it's just coming into summer, so you can't do cold soups, but lentil soup is definitely a, a favorite of mine. Anything that you can put in a bowl, like a Buddha bowl or a rice bowl, and I love the idea of the cowboy caviar on top of the, the rice bowl that would, or the Buddha bowl, that would be great. Pretty much anything in a wrap is, um, is a favorite of mine. And then growing up, and I do it myself now with my family, is we have something called shipwreck, which is just pretty much everything that's in your fridge that you've kind of had leftovers of. It all comes out and you make just, you make a meal out of that. And it's just, um, it's great because it's kind of fun and you get a little taste of everything that's been left over. And it's a great way to um, clean out your fridge before you do your next shop. So shipwreck is the one to do. I think it's all in the sales, right? Yes. I think that <laughs> is so much more appealing probably than saying, oh, leftovers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if you make it into a challenge, I yes. think that's, that's a yeah. good one. To okay. see what, what different combinations you can make from yes. the odd things that you pull out of the fridge. Yeah. At the end of the week, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds great. Okay. And uh, I'm totally with you on the bowls. Um, Allison. Uh, I love the shipwreck. Oh my gosh. I, I mean, people say kitchen sink about throwing, and I think that sounds gross. Like that's not a clean place. And it doesn't make me feel, it makes me think of dishes. So I love the idea of the, the shipwreck. That's good. And it might even entice some younger children because it's like a pirate pack or something, right? Um, so, and I make that often, uh, you know, ship, shipwreck uh, bottoms. I call them fridge bottoms. Um, and what we have um, in our house a lot is stir fries, probably because of the ramen noodles. And then we have peanut butter and we make a pad thai. Um, and uh, quiche uh, without the crust, so frittata eggs. <laughs> uh, and we, I make a lot and I put them into muffin tins and then I wait for them to cool and I freeze them in Ziploc bags in the freezer and then I pull out about four at a time. And um, yeah, they're quick, easy go. Uh, they used to go in lunch boxes, but now they, you know, they just go in my gardening basket. Uh, they travel well. So, and you can travel with them when they're frozen and then put in bits of um, lunch meat so you don't have to buy a whole new piece of meat. Um, leftover bacon, if there's such thing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, broccoli, spinach, cheese. That's, those are my go-tos. And then lots of, um, like frozen fruit smoothies because there's, I, I buy like a big bag and um, you know, they fill in the gaps between the shipwreck. <laughs> yeah. That's great, thank you. Um, Sonia, what do you have to share with us? Yeah, um, I love soups, that's totally, that was the top of my list because they're so versatile and adaptable, you can pretty much throw anything in them. You don't have to have certain veggies on hand. You can just throw in what you have. You can use a variety of different types of proteins, you know, chickpeas, pinto, kind of beans, as well as black beans, white beans, lentils, quinoa, chicken, fish. Um, and then just add in like your bouillon, bouillon cube and, you know, a couple of basic herbs or spices and you're good to go. So I love, I love soups. Um, also totally on the, the stir fry idea. Uh, we tend to do more brown rice and quinoa in our house. Um, but uh, yeah, totally love that because it's the same type of thing, right? You can throw in whatever veggies you have um, and choose your protein option, um, which can, may also include tofu or tempeh at that point. Um, another one I really like is vegetarian chili. Um, when you take out the meat, it gets a little bit less expensive, but it's still super filling, a great source of protein um, and really tasty and, you know, pretty easy to do. And again, there's lots of different types of chilies 
that you can do depending on what type of bean base you're using. And the last one I wanted to mention was salads when kind of the greens are in season. Um, if you're able to grow them in your backyard, then that's even better. Um, but you can also get them pretty inexpensively at the grocery store and make several meals out of that. Um, and again, lots of versatile protein options to include into there. So that's, that's kind of my favorite. That's wonderful. Thank you. And I have to say I'm a big fan of making soups also. And still it's even at this time of year. And I have to say one thing I do is I make a lot of puree soups. And then it's just a nice mellow color and there's no complaining or picking things out. It's just flavorful <laughs> all together. Um, Kim, what about you? Other than the cowboy caviar, I think we're all on top of that. First, I just have to say that I absolutely love all the names for the different meals that we have and what, we, what we're doing to kind of romance our families into eating some of these things that, you know, leftovers and kitchen sink and all that good stuff. It's just hilarious. Um, I think for me, I tend to really kind of go into a boom and bust with a lot of, at least what I eat at home, I'll get really excited about something and then just eat that for a long time. Um, and then move on to something else. Um, but I mean, we really kind of hit a lot of the things that I love. Like um, the Buddha bowl is kind of one of my favorites because you can, at least for me, I love doing kind of a brown rice and lentil base, which I think is, is pretty economical and really filling. And then it's just all the bits and pieces of the different vegetables and different proteins that you have available. Um, I, I'm a really big fan of the hollyhock dressing, but I know it's a bit expensive, right, to make. Um, so any kind of, you know, and whether that's a little bit of chutney or whatever you have condiment wise, I mean, you can, you can take a Buddha bowl in any direction um, cuisine wise that works for you. So I think that's kind of nice. Um, right now, one of, one of my favorite, like, uh, you know, tired after the work day, don't want to cook, don't want to do dishes kind of meals is something that I call the spicy tuna salad bowl. And I literally make it out of the bowl in the bowl that I eat it out of. Um, it's it's essentially like a we have a recipe at the kitchen called the master mix too, and it's basically kind of like it's essentially a coleslaw mix that you can use in a lot of different ways. Um, you could cook it up uh, as a side dish. You can add it as extra vegetables in a soup. Um, you can you know ferment it and turn it into a kraut, or you can eat it in uh, just as a salad itself. But essentially, my spicy tuna. Um, coleslaw recipe is really just like, you know, half a can of tuna, a tiny little bit of uh, some olive oil, mayo, a squirt of sriracha, um, a couple little bits of spices here and there, and then just mix that in with the coleslaw together. Um, if I have any, uh, you know, some sunflower seeds or something like that, it's great to add it on top, but it's just got a really nice flavor. Um, it's uh, easy to make and it's pretty filling. So um yeah lentils and rice buddha bowls what else um definitely lots of eggs i've been really loving doing the like the muffin cup uh little egg cups in the morning uh just being able to use up little bits of protein the different veggies that i have little pinches of cheese here and there and then it's a really great um quick breakfast or a quick snack to take with you and i also really love any kind of at least for myself i'll do a lot of mason jar lunches and salads all together um, and just grab that, shake it up and eat it whenever I need to. But my, my tip for, for quick and easy meals is to do as much of the, the prep work on your veggies um, in advance, especially when you're cooking for one, like starting from scratch with like mincing your garlic and chopping your onions and going through all those different pieces can sometimes be a bit of a barrier for like the amount of energy that you have and the time that you have, right? Um, and so for me, just having all of my veggies, when I have that energy, I just come back from the grocery store and I'm pretty stoked about all the good food um, that I have available. I'll chop up, wash up and chop up everything that I have. And then all week when I suddenly have no enthusiasm to cook every once in a while, it's just like a, you know, grab a dash, this, that, the other thing, put it in the pan, make a stir fry, put it in a Buddha bowl. And it just saves you all that chopping and all that work every, every meal from having to start at ground zero. So lots of good things. I think those are really good tips too for those who maybe aren't feeding a family or a crowd, but even for feeding yourself, if you're eating for one, it's still so important to be nourishing yourself and you might not always have the energy to go to the extent of making a full meal, but if you have everything already ready to go or something that you can pull out of the freezer, then I think it's more likely that you'll be eating well and uh, you deserve it, right? Everyone deserves it. 
So that, those are really good tips. Yes, thank you. And one thing I noticed from, um, from what all of you said, um, and I think this really goes towards a couple of things that are very important, I think, for all of us. Um, this goes towards um, making sure that we're stretching our food dollars as far as we can, but also reducing food waste. And that's a lot of the things healthy, but also using up little bits of things that um, sometimes might go to waste in your fridge, but these are ways that you can definitely um, be using them. So that's, that's a really good point there. So um, on to our next question. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges you think people face in eating well on a budget? And do you have tips on ways that people can overcome some of these challenges? So um, Kim, you're still unmuted, so I'm just gonna call on you first. Oh my. <laughs> sure. Um, well, I think at least for me, one of the biggest challenges I, I see is just the rising and ever-changing cost of food. So I, I think sometimes it can be a bit challenging to be um, planning your food budget when, you know, surprise, uh, celery has, is no longer the least expensive vegetable, um, you know, things like that. So I think definitely just the rise of cost of food, but also, um, you know, getting uh, enough nutrition and like a good balance in every meal. Um, I think is something that can be a bit of a, of a trick when you're living on a budget because some of the, especially like when we're talking about meats and nuts and seeds and some of the things that, you know, we're, we are recommended to eat can be quite preventative cost-wise. So I, I mean, I haven't seen an almond in like three years, <laughs> you know, um, but uh, I mean, really, at least for me, one of the tips is really getting a good understanding as to how to store your food um, and really thinking about, um, planning and budgeting and doing that prep work before you you head to the grocery store um, can really save a lot of money. In cooking school we used to say that um, food in the garbage is money in the garbage and so really focusing on on those um, ways where you can really make the get the biggest bang for your buck for what you're buying you know um, a lot of us you know say even with the pepper you're just chopping off those four quarters and you're losing all that top and that bottom like really using all those different aspects up there getting a ziploc bag in your freezer and saving uh, vegetable scraps um, for your veggie stock um, and also I think there's nothing you can't do and maybe you guys would agree there's nothing you can't pull off with a whole a whole roast chicken and how many meals the magical roast chicken is kind of one of my favorites um, so definitely looking at some of those skills and just exploring being kind to yourself and um, you know getting some good planning before you even head to the grocery store because um, that'll just save you a ton of cash right there absolutely and um, yeah, I can't remember the last time I could afford pine nuts. Gosh, <laughs> you were saying almonds. I was thinking, oh, pine nuts. Um, but uh, also, like you say in the planning, I just wanted to mention that um, it, we will also, with the recording of this, um, of the webinar, be linking to some good, like, tools and resources with some tips and recipes and um, uh, some planning tools also um, if you need a little bit of guidance on that so um, yeah we'll we'll definitely put that with the recording of of the webinar if you want to take a look at that thank you so um sonia would you like to chime in next sure um, so yeah i think the cost of food as kim mentioned is definitely a barrier for a lot of people um, and one of the things that I always do is I watch the sales and I go through all the flyers and figure out, you know, which store has the best uh, quantity of sale items that I want to be purchasing. So that's one of the key things. Um, and also looking for things that maybe have a higher price and looking for when they go on sale, I can kind of maybe buy a few more of those um, to keep on hand. Uh, so I don't have to worry about not having access to them when they're not on sale. Um, Again, buying in bulk when that's available. You can usually get items a bit cheaper. And looking at brands, um, so often store brands will be cheaper, but still, you know, the same product. So that's another way to kind of look at decreasing the cost of your food. 
And as Kim mentioned, I think planning ahead is a, is a really key thing. Um, either stocking up your pantry when items are on sale or freezing things as, as is mentioned with um, cheese. You can also freeze fish um, if you're able to get it on sale and things like that. So there's a lot of things that you can freeze and have um, that you can just kind of pull out and use later. Um, and also making sure that you have some sort of healthy proteins on hand so that you kind of have that as a really key component of each of your meals because that's really important for kind of just keeping our energy stable and our blood sugar level stable and helps kind of also keep us from grabbing for like processed items which often can be a bit more expensive so if you're kind of able to create your meals with a healthy protein on, on hand then that can really help with that as well so things you know like beans and chickpeas and as I mentioned uh, fish when you can get it on sale both canned and um, fresh um, I think sometimes food skills, as I, that also came up, that's also something that can be a barrier or just food energy, <laughs> you know, the energy to prepare a meal at the end of the day, especially. Um, so for that, I think one of my key things is just keeping it simple, um, not thinking that you have to create an extravagant meal, but kind of looking at what are the key components you want to have in your meal. So obviously protein, what's the, the vegetables that you're including or the fruit, if it's a breakfast item or you want to have something more sweet, um, and what's the fiber. And, you know, a lot of these items, ideas were already mentioned, but like things like having Buddha bowls or brown rice bowls or quinoa bowls, having soups, eggs, uh, potato stir fries, salads. So just keeping things simple and also looking out for recipes for ideas and remembering that every recipe, recipe is adaptable and can be modified with what you have. So even if you're looking at a recipe and you're like, oh, I don't have that specific vegetable, like, you can usually swap it out for something different, even swap out the protein or things like that. Um, and just when you have some time, maybe on the weekend, just to practice a little bit or um, look up free resources. There's like, there's tons of resources out there if you uh, want to improve some of those food skills. So um, yeah, there's lots out there. Yes, those are all really great tips, Sonia. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, you said about keeping it simple. And I remember I took a uh, cooking class with a chef once and um, we made this really complex meal. And afterwards I said, is this what you eat at home? And he said, no way. My go-to is scrambled eggs and toast and fruit. <laughs> he said, that's what I eat at home. So even those with all the skills in the world, Sometimes simple can be what you need. Yeah. <laughs> so um, who haven't we heard yet from on this? Allison? There we go. Um, I think some of the, um, the challenges that um, people face is, is energy. I definitely agree with um, Sonia on that one. I, even if I'm, you know, spend the day in the garden, I come home and I've just nurtured all of this beautiful produce. And then I'm like, I'm too tired to like wash the lettuce and make salad. So um, I have to plan ahead. Uh, planning ahead is definitely something um, that, because if it's done, then it doesn't take any energy. Um, I think what Kim said, when you come home from the grocery store, prep it like you know peel up all of those carrots and uh put them in you know tupperware containers or reuse some yogurt container or something and um chop up all the broccoli and the cauliflower every time that you pull the cauliflower out to want to make something you get this like cauliflower mess and then you're like i don't want to make anything with that because it's going to be messy again but once it's done and it's in florette form you're like i'm going to just toss that in also as a snack because it's already um, prepped. Um, I think effort um, kind of goes along with energy and inspiration. If you're cooking for a child, just you and your kids, they complain about everything. You're like, why bother? Um, if you're cooking on your own, that can also be pretty um, uninspiring. I, you know, tea and toast was always this thing that everybody talked about when you just start eating on your own, it's not really, fun so um trying to find some inspiration in some way shape or form so um i think apps youtube um you know for our digital digital world we're in 
Um, and uh, freezer stuff. I always feel like if um, I make twice as much as that I'm going to eat, uh, I can put it in the freezer and then try to feed it to the kids again. Um, use uh, frozen peas and frozen vegetables. I buy um, lots of bread and things like that from the freezer items when they're on sale and then they just go in the freezer. Um, yeah, so that's my, I think those are the challenges and my tips would be yeah, to just use, go through old cookbooks when you're, maybe not when you're hungry, but, um, and then just planning ahead, just going to the grocery store with an idea that you, you're going to make like these three meals and then you're going to flip them every second day or something. So you don't have to come up with a new thing every day. You don't need seven new menu items, but um, just to go to, so you don't have to think about it because if, you know, we're too busy thinking about a gazillion other things. There's no time to think about what we're going to eat because we're hungry, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's, that's what I'd say. Perfect. Yes. And Erily, what would you have maybe have to add? Well, I think some of the issues and challenges can be, you know, um, certainly that stress and busy mind if you're concerned about, um, you know, the, the cost of food, the cost of living, and, and that, you know, your mind can be sort of preoccupied from that stress. Um, also, taste fatigue or like boredom with the food that you're eating. Sort of if you're having just a very limited amount, um, not amount, but variety of foods, that can really lead to boredom of those foods. And then, you know, access to veggies and fruit, perhaps, and, you know, emotional eating could also be, that can be a challenge with or without any sort of budgetary con con um, restrictions there. Some of the things to, like, avoid, I would avoid um, around avoiding boredom or taste fatigue is, I love that someone said, you know, buy some some spices in bulk, like small amounts, and maybe it's once a month you're adding to your spice collection a small amount of something so that over time you've built up some of those things. And then learning how to make some really easy sauces like a peanut sauce or a curry, like, you know, having curry paste on hand or something like that. Um, sort of some of those basic but really potent sauces like balsamic vinegar or soy sauce, you know, having those getting those over time can be helpful growing your own herbs I love that boring a cookbook you know but not when you're hungry looking at those uh, you know three ingredient meals five ingredient meals um, cooking and sharing meals with friends or family and I know that's a little bit tricky right now um, but there are ways to do it as we know um, and in terms of that you know stress and busy mind I'll try, you know, breathing, <laughs> breathing before um, a meal or preparing a meal, doing self-care, getting that adequate sleep so that we can handle stress um, in a more productive way. Also, I just love the access to veggies and fruit that, that we have um, access to through, um, well, Good Food Box or BC Farmers Market coupons, many of our programs who support uh, low-income families, seniors, or um, pregnant moms uh, and young families have access to BC Farmers Market Nutrition Coupon Program, um, community kitchens, low, no-cost meals. I love those um, perfectly imperfect items, you know, those discount ugly fruit or, you know, when cosmetically challenged vegetables, like those kind of things are a great idea. Um, and then... Uh, you know, remembering to, to include that protein. I know it's been mentioned before, but just so important to to include that and some healthy fats. And then sort of some so other solutions like those, like a no-cook meal, like overnight oats or I love the smoothies, um, wraps, salads, you know, and um, yeah, just even having like plant, some plain yogurt on hand, you could make so many things with plain yogurt and make and make uh, food stretch and sauces stretch with that. Um, yeah, I love the roasted chicken, right? What can't you do with a roasted chicken? But eggs, you know, boil them, fry them, scramble them, poach them, frittata them. You know, it's all of those those things that can be done. 
I think I took too much time. No, that was wonderful. Okay. Thank okay, you. Okay, crock so pot. Much. Crock pot. That's my last one. Crock pot. Yes. <laughs> crock pot. Grew yes. up on crock pot. Yeah. yeah. For sure. So, um, just one last question. I know we're running low on time, but I think this is a really important one because of all the things we've been sharing and talking about food in the pantry, um, tips and things like that. But what about for people who might not have a lot of skills when it comes to food and cooking, baking, um, all the rest of it? What advice would you have maybe for them on where, where to start? Um, mm -hmm. If, if, uh, when when those skills aren't maybe able to whip up a frittata, right? right. Mm -hmm. So, um, Early, you're unmuted, so I'm gonna call oh. on you first. <laughs> right, darn, missed that mute button. Well, I do, I, I think it was Allison that had mentioned, you know, this digital world, this virtual world that we're living in right now. I think there's so much opportunity there for posting simple, um, simple quick videos of uh, sort of how to's even or you know getting involved in the community kitchen um, on Shelburne or you know asking a friend to show you some some uh, basic cooking skills um, even things like for cooking eggs or pasta or grains that sort of thing um, there, I mean, there are so many great programs that that are happening, and um, you know, like for example, at, at Blanchard with their virtual uh, food skills for youth program, like those sorts of things. Um, if you're connected to an agency that offers programming, consider you know taking something online, asking folks what it is that they would like to learn about in terms of food prep and. Um, I, one of my favorite activities to do is uh, with groups is to do like a cooking out of the box. So taking a good food box that's just been delivered and I don't even know what's in it and opening them up and it's like a surprise and an opportunity to share what it is that's in there, how it can be used and how to keep it fresh or revitalize it if it's a, if you know, if the celery's limp or, you know, that sort of thing when you're talking about love food, hate waste, that sort of thing. I think those are some, there's some real opportunities for us around that. Absolutely. Thank you for mentioning all those great local programs and resources for sure. Um, maybe to Kim next. Sure. Um, first and foremost, I always kind of start with just coming from a place of like, you know, kindness and self-compassion for yourself because we all have different skill sets and experiences and different things that we've learned um, growing up. And so we all kind of come, come at it from different places. And so I always, in our cooking programs here, remind everybody that we all have something to learn and we all have something that we can teach others. Um, and if, I know it's all kind of craziness right now, but if, if you can't get out to a cooking program, um, I definitely recommend like finding a friend that you really love hanging out with and cooking uh, together even just like once a week and bringing each your favorite recipe and exchanging because then that way you learn from each other and there's so much organic learning that really comes with just like being there with others and cooking with others um, you know it's incredible what you'll find there but I mean the nice thing about cooking programs and any kind of group activities in that sense is it gives you an opportunity to explore and try out new recipes without dinging your own grocery budget like if any of you guys have tried to you know, tried a new recipe that was you know you're really excited about and then it just was an absolute fail it's it's not only um you know food that you're no longer able to really enjoy because it didn't work out so well but that's also money that that was spent in another place so i've always found cooking programs to be a really great opportunity to explore with support and without any kind of financial um ding there and then you can kind of build but one of the things for me when i'm talking about starting um to build your food skills is is thinking about, you know, writing yourself a list of all the foods you really love. 
whether that's like a takeout or stuff that your parents have made or, you know, things you've had at a potluck, write down all your favorite foods, your favorite meals that you love and start looking on the internet or at the library or in cookbooks about different recipes to make that and kind of trim them down and, and try them out because, um, you know, whether we're living on a, on a limited budget or not, if, if we aren't really enjoying the foods that we're eating, um, you know, there's, I think there's both nutrition and also just like self-care and, and the joy of food in itself. Um, and when we're talking about my last little tip here, when we're talking about meal planning and budgeting, that's a whole other skill set in its own, which I, I know can come with its, um, you know, its own challenges. Um, and so one thing that I really um, loved and that we've used at the Shelburne Community Kitchen quite a lot is Sandy Richards Eat Sheets. Um, it's kind of like, it's really just a simple kind of chart, but what, what she talks about in her books that I've loved is you really kind of build your collection of recipes in a binder and from all of those recipes that you build over time that you love to eat, that becomes kind of your, your weekly meal plan or your, your, your recipes for the week. And on your eat sheet, that's where you're writing down all the ingredients for all that you need to make all of those recipes all in one. Stick that in a page protector. And what I love to do that helps with my meal planning, I'll grab that page protector, uh, oh, sorry, that eat sheet. I know it's got everything that I need to make all of those meals. And I'll go to my pantry and just scratch off all the stuff I have. And it's an instant grocery list. And you don't have to worry about like forgetting that one ingredient or this, that, the other thing. And it's just a, like a really nice customizable um, tool and it's something that you can kind of build on and kind of get maybe a few different meal plans um, that would be about a week long or so and then you can kind of change it up too so be kind to yourself everybody's got to learn and everyone has something to teach find a friend or find a cooking program to be a part of um, and, and take some time to see how you can really make the best use of your money by a little bit of planning and a little bit of organization wow that was great and we're definitely going to have to a uh, link to that uh, resource that you mentioned, the eat sheets. That's that's a really good idea. I like that one. Um, Allison, what would you have to add in one minute or less? Oh, uh, yeah, I totally agree. You need to have a playlist of your favorite foods uh, that you rotate. Um, I was thinking too that uh, Instagram, you can follow people's pictures of, your, of their food and then the recipes and how they do it. And I mean, even TikTok, it'll give you a minute on how to make stuff. So it's just a quick, if you need quick, uh, YouTube will have long ones that are dragged out. And um, your mom, your grandma, uh, there's some really great um, war cooking or depression cooking. And that's really, really stretching your budget because it's, you know, I mean, it was hard times. So there was lots of, there's a YouTube channel that I follow and it's, it's highly recommended <laughs> how to make something from nothing really. Yeah. Was that a minute? <laughs> yes. So what's the YouTube channel? Uh, it's uh, how to cook in the depression or depression oh. cooking. That would don't be interesting. Subscribe yeah. and things when something, yeah. It's a lovely old lady. She's very, Amazing. I love, and I feel like that's the best resources is just other people, you know, post on Facebook, Hey, give me your top three meals. And then you're going to have 25 or more by the end of the day. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Sonia, would you like to end us off? You get the last, last word. Yeah. Whatever we shared was just fantastic. I totally um, echo connecting with other people and it doesn't even have to be people, you know, like, people on Facebook, if you're part of a mom's group, there's always lots of people uh, willing to help out and give ideas or a community group or, you know, any other Facebook participant group that you're on that's uh, a bit more broad based. Um, and YouTube is amazing. There's like anything you want to find. If you want to learn how to, you know, do something you don't know how to do or you want to do something better, then just search it on YouTube and something will pop up for you. So that's a great resource to kind of um, improve your cooking skills. Um, and if you can, this is a slightly different tangent, but if you can get your family involved, if you have a family, um, then that's also can make cooking a bit more fun and you can kind of learn and do it together. Um, and that can be just a different way to kind of also support your children to learn those, those cooking skills as well and really, um, improve their kind of food repertoire and things like that. And the other thing is just keeping it simple, as I mentioned before. Um, I love what Kim mentioned about having um, some compassion for yourself. 
try not to worry about keeping things too perfect. I mean, obviously, hopefully you'll make something that you enjoy at the end. Um, you don't want to waste food either, but you know, not trying to not make it a stressful experience. Hopefully it can be something that is at least somewhat enjoyable. Um, and again, just remembering that if you are looking at recipes, there's so many things that can be adapted in them. And the first time when you're just getting to know cooking, that can be really intimidating. Um, but just kind of practicing, trying things out, seeing, you know, where you can swap this for that. Um, and again, that's also something you can always um, search on the internet if you're not sure of, you know, how to swap things. Um, and then thinking about, um, yeah, just starting simple, you know, just a recipe at a time and adding to your repertoire. As Kim mentioned, I love that idea that she shared. That was awesome. Um, yeah, and just going at your own pace, not thinking that you have to do it all at once, but just, yeah, doing what you can do and starting out with one recipe here and adding on another one, you know, the next week and things like that. Or Great. You know. That's, that's wonderful. I know we're a couple of minutes over, but wow, we covered so much ground. I wanted to thank our speakers so much for their time today and sharing um, such valuable practical tips and information, resources. Um, I, I know I've, I will be taking away some important tips here and ideas, and I hope this is first our first opportunity to share like this, because I think this is really valuable, especially since so many people too are growing their own food for the first time this year. And they're going to need to know ideas on what to do with all the, the new th crops that they're growing. And uh, so I, I'm sure we'll uh, have to have a follow up to this too. Um, so please do know that we are going to be posting some resources um, when we post the recording of this and please do share this with um, others in the community that you think might be able to learn from this opportunity.